Welcome to this policy dialogue on SDG 10. How can we make the world more equal? Here we invited a panel of distinguished speakers with extensive experience in academia, decision making or international organizations to give us their views on how to reduce inequality in this very difficult context dominated by the dramatic effects of the pandemic, all the new conflicts, the climate emergency, or the energy and food crisis, among other challenges. For that, we will have Sharanjit Lail, a broadcaster with more than 20 years of experience covering international business, finance, and politics, anchoring several BBC news programs, who came all the way from Singapore to moderate this event. Before starting with the dialogue, I wanted to set the scene, highlighting a few facts about the current trends on global inequality using the World Income Inequality Database hosted at UNOWIDER, the WEED. So considering the distribution of income among all citizens in the world, regardless of where they live, the country of residence, what we know as global inequality, we can say that the income share of the world's richest 10% has been declining since around 2000. While the share of the rest of the population, here the poorest 40% and the middle 50%, so between the percentiles 41 and 90, have increased. Therefore, the ratio between the income held by the top 10% and the bottom 40%, a measure of inequality known as Palma Ratio, has been declining over this period. This decline, however, shows a decelerating rate in most recent years, and the pandemic implied a serious setback. Using IMF projections for GDP per capita between 2021 and 2027, and in the scenario of stable country-level inequality, which might not be the case, the declining trend might still continue in the next years. The Gini and other measures of inequality show a similar trend. They also show that the decline was entirely driven by declining inequality between countries. When you take the average income of each country, and we compute, we estimate the inequality among people in the world where everybody has the income of their country. While inequality within countries has been more persistent or increased. It's also very clear that the declining inequality between countries was due to China and to a much lesser extent India and other developing countries growing faster than most advanced economies. This may raise the question about its continuity since China has already reached the global mean and will no longer contribute to this reducing inequality and eventually will contribute to increase it. Based on the mentioned projections, it seems that the process would continue at least until 2027, sustained by the strong growth expected by India. But there is an obvious risk that the trend is later reversed, what Ravi Kanbur and co-authors call the global inequality boomerang in a wider working paper that you can check. If growth is not strong enough in the rest of the developing world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, or if the expectations for these projections of growth are not fully met. At the same time, the persistent inequality or increasing inequality within countries reflects a quite heterogeneous situation in which we have evidence of increasing inequality in some countries and decreasing inequality in others, with a net effect depending on where China and India stand and what's the period of reference. For example, here you have that with available evidence since around 2015, inequality increased for 54 countries representing more than half of the world population, 55%, which include the two most popular, China and India. While inequality improved in other 74 countries, so uh, a larger number of countries, but representing a smaller proportion of population, 29%. Similar results can be appreciated with the income share of the bottom 40%, which is the official measure adopted in SDG 10, 
since its changes are highly correlated with the Gini index. But what brought us here today is to ask our panel of experts, what can be done to make the world more equal, both between and within countries? And what are the main challenges to reduce inequality in the years to come? So I'm calling Saranjit Leil to the stage. Thank you, Carlos. What a great and engaging introduction that was. And how wonderful to be here in Bogota at this extraordinary institution and be a part of this very uh, important discussion on how to make the world more equal. It's a real privilege to be amongst all of you here, uh, all of you development economists, students uh, at this incredible institution of learning. Now, as you heard Carlos say, despite some strides in recent years, global inequality is actually increasing. Uh, this has exacerbated the risks of divisions. It's hampered economic and social development around the world. Meanwhile, of course, we've had the COVID-19 pandemic, and that has caused the first rise in between country income inequality in a generation. Imagine that, the first rise. And it has hit the poorest and the most vulnerable communities the hardest, significantly increasing global unemployment and dramatically slashing workers' incomes. The pandemic has put a big spotlight on the fragile social safety nets that leave vulnerable communities to bear the brunt of the crisis. We're seeing it everywhere. So in this session, we're asking how we can make the world more equal. What stands in the way of reducing inequalities? What needs to be done to achieve this crucial global goal? And by whom? And once achieved, how do we sustain this reduced inequalities? Can we achieve SDG 10, which calls for the reduction of inequality within and among countries by the 2030 deadline? Well, in this policy dialogue, a panel of distinguished speakers with long experience in academia, decision-making, and government will join me to answer these questions. And of course, I'm going to invite them up on stage right now. And we'd love to hear from all of you at the end of the discussion as well. Lots of questions, please. So let me introduce Santiago Levy, the Brookings Institution and former Mexican Deputy Finance Minister. He was also the president of the Latin American and Caribbean Economic Association and vice president of Inter-American Development Bank. A round of applause, please. Thank you, Santiago. We also have Anil de Sarmanto. She's the National Director at the Mozambique Ministry of Economy and Finance. Anil de, come and join us here on stage. Yeah, have a seat. And of course, no stranger to all of you, you just heard her up here on stage in the last hour, is Marcela Eslava, Professor of Economics and Dean of the School of Economics right here at this university in Bogota. Thank you, Marcela. Join us here on stage. And we're also very excited to have your finance minister at any moment. Uh, of course, this is none other than Jose Antonio Ocampo. He is slightly delayed, but we are hoping he will be able to join us in this, this discussion, this very important discussion at some point. So let us begin. It's great to see all of you. We've got this uh, extra seat here for the finance minister when he arrives. Of course, he's got a very important job. He's currently in government right now, and we're hoping to see him very soon. But let's start off this conversation first, uh, which is, of course, it's one of, possibly one of the greatest challenges of our time, uh, how to reduce inequality. It's right there, big words on the screen there. So let's hear from each of you and what you bring to this conversation in terms of, of course, your extraordinary expertise. How have you tackled the seemingly intractable problem of inequalities in your countries and institutions? And are you optimistic it can be fixed? Let's start with you, Santiago. You can grab a mic there. Great. Um, thank you. And uh, let me first begin by thanking Marcela Los Andes, uh, Marcela, and Kunal Sen. Oh, over here. Uh, thank you, Kunal, for inviting me to be part of this conference. And uh, lovely to be in this panel with all of you. So the question is, is, is very complex. And 
the short answer would be piece by piece. This right. is not a problem for which there's a magic wand. This is not a problem for which a single policy is actually going to provide the kind of equal or inclusive societies that we want. You want to move on various fronts, and you can make a very long list. Many of the people that are here have worked on all these dimensions. You know, try to improve the pre-market distribution of income by investing in education. Try to improve the post-market distribution of income through taxes and transfers. Um, one bit, when you ask me what have I done when I was in government, was to try to transfer resources to people at the lowest part of the distribution, people that we think of in extreme poverty, uh, through mechanisms that are more efficient than in the past. This helps to reduce inequality. It's far from what needs to be done to do inequality, but is part of the piece. Uh, that said, Latin America has been doing that for the last two decades, and it's a good time for Latin America to move beyond that and to start thinking that if they really want to make a dent on inequality, we can no longer rely only on this set of programs. We really have to think much more ambitiously of transforming particularly the structure of social protection. I don't want to take much time. We yeah. can come back to this. Absolutely. We'll get into that in the discussion. Marcela. Well, so let me talk about my own emphasis in, in my work, um, which has been on what I would say two main issues that many people miss when we think about uh, inequality, particularly in the discussions within countries. Um, one of those is the huge inequalities across countries uh, that Carlos was talking about uh, a minute ago. Of course, uh, as Carlos was showing, uh, those have been decreasing, but still we have incredibly large gaps in incomes across countries, with uh, the richest country in the world having around uh, 20 times the income of the, uh, the poorest country in the world. And if we think of the economies of Latin America, uh, given where we are and, and from where uh, Santiago and I are, are talking, uh, you're talking about countries with a fourth, a fifth, of the income of uh, the richer countries. So that's one issue uh, that is crucial. Then there is a second issue um, that, uh, that tends to bring tensions, and uh, that is the potential uh, conflict between uh, growth and uh, inequality. For instance, uh, with the focus in the global debate about potentially curbing the uh, growth of some uh, superstar firms, um, uh, which has been proven to lead to greater inequality in some of the richer countries in the world. And I would say, uh, again, speaking from uh, the region, I think uh, one crucial thing to bring to the table is the lack of that tension in uh, our economies, or that, that's at least my conclusion from the analysis of the data, and the need of, uh, of, uh, for the debate uh, to uh, bring in the specificities of inequalities in different countries, and uh, for Latin America in particular, the fact that inequality in our region is so inextricably linked to poverty, to vulnerability, and the fact that uh, people in those conditions tends to be out of a, a, uh, a formalized, organized uh, business sector, yeah. which is very much linked, again, to uh, a very poor growth in the past uh, few years. So I would bring yeah. those two issues to the table, which, by the way, I ver are very related to the social protection issue that uh, Santiago Absolutely. Was, uh, yeah, we'll bringing. get into that discussion uh, in a little bit. And, Anilde, we're, we're interested in your perspective from an African viewpoint. Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Thank you um, for this opportunity to share what we are trying to do in these times uh, to make the, uh, the world more equal. Uh, for countries like uh, Mozambique uh, that uh, was facing uh, several shocks, uh, Mozambique, for example, uh, uh, faced uh, several shocks in short term. We had to deal with um, cyclones. We had to deal with uh, debt crisis, uh, internal conflicts, and now with pandemic and um, 
in these days with the energy and food crisis. In fact, uh, what we saw in, in terms of results is uh, uh, inequality increasing and poverty increasing. And uh, the challenge is, in fact, how to fix this uh, in the context that we have to find the fiscal space to deal with this challenge. Uh, the governments uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, in Mozambique, are trying to work in the short-term policies in the, and look for the other that uh, it is a long-term policy. Because in our countries, with the, uh, a large informal sectors, uh, a lack of diversities, uh, in fact, is, is a challenge. But I think that we can fix. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to work in the short-term policy, as I said, uh, to look for the, the, these vulnerability families that uh, are living near to the poverty line. Uh, we have to uh, adjust our social programs. We have, uh, in the short terms, we have to look for the families. Uh, how can uh, we design policies uh, to solve uh, uh, their challenge, uh, to be able to, to, uh, to deal with, the, for example, the increasing of the prices of the food, yeah. these kind of issues, but I think that it's possible. Yeah, and that's what we're here to discuss, you know, the kind of policies needed, so desperately required to t address a lot of those challenges you mentioned. Well, let's continue talking about those challenges because today we're facing the context of a, a, a post-pandemic situation. It's been aggravated by an energy and food crisis. And of course, this is against the backdrop of global warming. So yeah, it doesn't sound great, does it? There's a lot of problems out there. So to what extent have these challenges made reducing inequalities even harder? Is it tough as a result, because of all of this incredibly bad news we've had in recent years, is it tough as a result to get people, whether it's the government, um, academia, the media, uh, the population at large, to pay attention to this crucial problem of trying to reduce inequality? Who'd like to take that question, that answer? Try that one. Hello? Yes, we hear you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I, I don't think the problem needs publicity. I mean, at least in Latin America, the issue of inequality is keenly and deeply felt by everybody. Um, now, what COVID did is it showed how unprepared most countries in the region were to protect population from shocks and as a result of that, you get increases in inequality. Now, if you want to see the silver lining on that, hopefully, maybe not, hopefully, governments will learn that there is no substitute for having insurance. The real reason that COVID created so much pain is because the insurance mechanisms that are deployed by governments in Latin America in most places are very incomplete, very erratic, very inefficient. So we have households that if they had had insurance against this shock, could have avoided falling into poverty. We don't have that insurance, so what we do is we wait for them to be poor, and then once they're poor, yeah, okay, we'll help you. It'd be much better, of course, if you prevented a lot of this from happening. Now, the insurance would only be to shocks like income that was associated with COVID, low participation rate, but also many other shocks that families are continuously experiencing because of disability, because of health, because of illness, yeah. because of many other things. Now, half of the population broadly for Latin America as a whole, but 60% in Colombia, 60% in Mexico, 80% in Peru and Bolivia, yes. is continuously exposed to shocks and All they right. have no protection. I'm just going to stop you the for a moment there. We have the finance minister himself. Thank you so much for making time for us uh, this afternoon in this crucial conversation. Uh, Jose Antonio Campo, lovely to meet you. Thank you. Please come and join us. Yes, a round of applause, please.
Yes, so we've started the conversation uh, without you, but of course you are an expert. You are having to deal with this on a daily basis in your job. But um, let's hear from you about some of the challenges that Colombia is facing, because uh, I started off asking everyone, you know, what is the situation we're in right now? How do you describe this current situation, this post-pandemic context, and what are some of the serious issues that you're trying to get to? Well, thank you very much, and, and let me, of course, uh, welcome all of those who have come from abroad to this conference. Uh, let me say that wider has been particularly important for, in my life, since the very beginning, I was one of the, probably the first researchers of WIDER. Uh, so for me, uh, it has been very important. Uh, 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 and on top of that, uh, publishing my books. The last book on the, yes. <laughs> the, last book on the International Monetary System yes. uh, was a joint edition. Uh, for, uh, fortunately, also, all, uh, actually, a, a, a free access book. So I can send it to, you know, to uh, anywhere. <laughs> I think that's one of the greatest innovations. But of course, someone has to pay for those books. And why they pay for mine? Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. On the international monetary system. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, and this is of course uh, my, my university. This is where I started my career. Uh, I continue to be a professor uh, when I can. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, no, thank you. Uh, well, let me perhaps uh, say that the. Um, uh, the challenges of Colombia uh, uh, are in, you know, there are some good uh, things that have been happening, notably uh, uh, the recovery uh, of the economy after the pandemic uh, and, the, uh, and the social uh, protests of last year uh, has been uh, uh, quite striking. Uh, unfortunately, that has finished. Uh, we are now in a, in a period of, uh, in which, uh, you know, growth is slowing down. Uh, significantly, and, um, and let me say that the uh, uh, that the, the expectation for the next year uh, is uh, relatively uh, uh, weak, yes. uh, uh, less than one percent, according to the uh, last uh, estimates of the central bank. Uh, I think we're a bit more optimistic in the government, but uh, but anyway, that's the um, uh, the uh, uh, and, and that's because uh, of probably uh, mainly of international shocks. I mean, the, the international stocks uh, of which I would say, uh, in order, the most important is the high interest rates yes. associated to the fight against inflation. Uh, because uh, that impl has implied that uh, uh, Colombia has uh, 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 basically no, uh, well, the, the cost of financing in, in international private markets is too expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't make sense for the government to issue bonds in international markets. And of course, uh, that translates into decisions and, uh, and trends in interest rate domestically. That's right. Uh, and that's so, just happened recently to 10%, yeah. I believe, your benchmark interest rate. Yeah, the central bank, the last decision was 10%. You know, we have this uh, funny system in which yeah. the finance minister also is a member of the board. Yes. It's probably one of the few, actually the chair of the board, uh, <laughs> but has only one vote. Yes. Out, out of seven. <laughs> so it's... Uh, it's not but, very powerful position. But as you say, it is a tough situation, so trying to handle it with policy, uh, particularly with interest rates, is, is a real issue, isn't it? Yeah. And that's one of the ways to tackle uh, yeah. some of these problems we're yeah. facing. And the, the, the big question mark uh, in Colombia as worldwide is uh, uh, to what extent uh, uh, interest rates actually help to reduce inflation. Yeah. Uh, because this is a, a truly a supply shock Yes. Uh, internationally, uh, you know, which had started actually uh, uh, at the end of uh, uh, last year in commodity prices, uh, but of course was speeded up uh, by the invasion of, uh, right. uh, of, uh, yeah. of Ukraine by Russia uh, in February, and, and then the, 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 the prices of foods, uh, uh, of, uh, of course, of uh, Energy. Uh, uh, yeah. oil and coal, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, mm -hmm. which of course has associated to the gas prices. Uh, they, they have, you know, skyrocketed everywhere in, uh, throughout the world, yeah. and they actually have also had a, a negative effect on production worldwide because of the high fertilizer prices. Yeah. So, so it's a it's a big problem, uh, uh, you know, to what extent the central banks. So, uh, so the, everything I think depends on international trends. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm hopeful that the uh, particularly the U.S. inflation rate 
right. has fallen last month. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll, we'll right. know the number uh, no. in the next few days. Uh, because yeah. I think that will have a, a, a significant effect. So that's, I would say, interest rates because of high inflation is the toughest thing to, uh, to, it is to very manage tough, indeed. Uh, now. Now, on the other hand, uh, we have the, um, uh, the, the fiscal situation, which is the one, uh, the issue that I have to manage. Yes, we'll be talking <laughs> about that further into the discussion. So I will just jump in there. Anilda, it's very interesting you were nodding your head uh, in agreement uh, with the finance minister. Let's hear about the Mozambique perspective because, you know, external shocks is something that impacts your country in a, in a great way as well. Yes, okay. yes uh, thank you. Um, yes, uh, interna, uh, external shocks is impacting in, in interesting rate. And I was agreed with here because I, I don't know. Uh, in Mozambique, the central bank is increasing the, the, the rate, interest rate to control the inflation, but we are not quite sure if uh, this, is, this is the way this will solve this, this problem, because on the other hand, we have this household that are facing this challenge uh, to buy uh, food, uh, and uh, increasing the interest rates, for example, for countries like Mozambique, uh, that have a high internal debt, it will impact in the debt too mm -hmm. and uh, in the economic activity for the investors. So it's a challenge, in fact. It's a challenge. This is uh, what I can say. Okay. <laughs> So we're definitely all agreed that there are vast challenges out there that need to be tackled. But let's hear from you know, some of the kind of policy uh, had, that has gone in play in the past. And of course, uh, Santiago, you're, you're a real expert at that, having you know, dealt with the situation in Mexico, putting in place you know, social safety nets and policies that made a, a vast difference for Mexico. Tell us a little bit about what you did at the time, uh, Progresa, and whether you know, it could still work to some, to some extent today. So very briefly, oh, sorry. we're trying to work out which mics work. I, I, <laughs> always, I always get the lemon, the, 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 the lemon microphone. Uh, <laughs> uh, very briefly, because this is something that many, many people in the audience are, are fairly familiar with. But broadly, what we had is a major crisis in 94-95, uh, large fall in GDP, about 6%. It was evident that this was going to have a large impact on the incomes of people, increased poverty. The, the central problem we face is that the government had no instruments to help the poor. Or whatever instruments were there were extremely inefficient. So the thought was to try to provide income to households in a much direct way, literally by handing out money. However, the thought was also that you don't want to do this forever, so let's do something at the same time that you do that to try to ensure that in the future they won't need these income transfers by investing in their human capital. And that was the birth of CCTs in which you transfer cash conditional upon people making investments in the human capital of households on the expectations that later on that would happen. Now, more interesting and more relevant for today. 20 years later, households have accumulated human capital. There's tons of evidence. Many people here have written papers about that. And so we do know that people have better health, more years of schooling, less morbidity, etc., better nutrition. But what we also know is that despite the fact that many of these poor people have more human capital, they're not getting better jobs. Mm. So the intertemporal uh, elimination of poverty by this mechanism of investing in human capital, the so human capital has been accumulated, but the better jobs are not out there. And the reason made a major mistake, broadly speaking, for Latin America by betting too much on these programs and not doing enough to tackle the central problems in the labor market that segment our labor markets into formal and informal segments and keep people in low productivity jobs and which makes it very difficult to go ahead. So thinking about inequality about the future, if you really want to tackle inequality from the bottom up, you have to think about mechanisms to raise the incomes of people at the lower part of the distribution, not only through transfers, but through more productive jobs. And that requires tackling the fundamental problems that we have in formality, informality, and that requires a complete redesign of social protection systems 
and that passes through taxation. Absolutely. And that's the center core that would make our societies less unequal than what they're today. Stop here. But as we know, taxation is tough. We'll be getting into that, and I'm sure the minister can shed some light in it. I believe you've been debating some of that tax reform here in Colombia. So what I'd like to hear is just how tough is it to get those social safety nets in play? As you say, Santiago, you know, your incredible Progresa policy was emulated across South America and was incredibly successful. It addressed some of the issues around extreme poverty, but it didn't address the issue of social safety nets. So give us a sense of just how difficult, as a development economist, uh, Marcela, how tough it is to get something like that in play. And of course, the tensions that creates when it comes to then trying to get an economy to grow. So thank you, and let me uh, go back a little bit to what Santiago is saying, which is, is I think it is uh, definitely very linked to, um, to the question you're, you're raising. Um, to think of the complement between those good jobs where incomes are generated um, and then the need for social protection that comes on top of that. And refer a little bit to what I am inferring is uh, in, in the comment by Santiago, uh, which is w there is some relationship between the um, attempt to create strong safety nets, uh, the difficulties that we face in the labor market, and the consequent uh, difficulties to create uh, uh, good jobs. One particularity of the region is that we do have uh, social security systems that are aimed at providing high protection to workers. Uh, they are very uh, rich in that sense. They uh, l provide for workers health, pension, some other coverages, um, um, in, in, including sometimes a recreational uh, features. But the key thing is that when they provide that for workers, it is a very peculiar type of worker that is protected. And that is the worker who is in the formal sector, who has a formal job. That job is paying for that social protection through contributions. And in fact, this person does have some protection while he or she is in that formal job. But the, the complement to that is that because the job is paying in the end for some of these features, uh, then the job may be very costly. And it is very costly. Uh, for instance, for an employer in the context of low productivity in general. So when the average worker that you has has low productivity, that means that for the employer, the amount of income that this person is going to generate for the, for the business uh, may not cover those costs. And that seems to be, in several studies, part of the reasons why it is so difficult to generate this job. So in the end, what you have is the system that is uh, geared up to uh, provide very good protection. Some people do get that very good protection, but then a lot of people uh, is left out. That, of course, is, uh, generates gaps, uh, generates a, 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 let me call it segmentation, right. even though it's not perfect segmentation, uh, of people who are, say, in the middle class, and then people who are really vulnerable uh, and poor. Um, and again, there may be an answer. There may be an answer now going back to your question of how to better do that uh, in taxation, in how to redesign really these things so that we can protect workers, that we can pr provide that uh, social protection that is needed, but that the cost is not necessarily put upon the generation of the job. Absolutely. So let's hear from the government perspective now. We've got the minister, and obviously uh, Anil there also works within the Ministry uh, of Finance and Economy. So give us a sense of the kind of social protections that are in place right now, and what steps are you taking to try to improve them so that they're targeted to the poorest? Let me start by saying that I don't like the term social safety net. Okay. I What's the term you would use? I, I like social protection or social security. Okay. Perhaps because I have always been a social democrat. So That's my, right. <laughs> so it's, it's so the same, same, same expression. expression. It's a, it's a debate words. I have uh, yeah. quite a bit in the U.S. because the, the term safety net is, uh, is used uh, 
extensively in the U.S. I have always complained. No, that's not a good concept. Anyway, social protection, social security. Yes. Uh, uh, le let, me, let me say in that regard that, uh, uh, I mean, first of all, the, the problems of the labor market are important. But first of all, let's say employment is, at the end, the most important instrument for, uh, for poverty reduction and a, and a good the, uh, a mix of, uh, of employment generation, the, the best way to improve income distribution. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now, uh, on the other hand, you have, uh, uh, let's say, in the, in, the, in the social policy area, uh, uh, we have, first of all, the, uh, the instruments that you aim to, uh, to become universal. I have always been a good uh, defender of universal systems yeah. uh, rather than targeted system. Uh, so the, uh, a universal uh, basic income? Well, Is that something you're talking about? Or? No, right. Yeah. So it's universal systems. Mm -hmm. I, mean, uh, they, they, I mean, in education, in health, in, uh, uh, in housing, uh, uh, access to, uh, 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 say, uh, utilities, like water, uh, uh, water, sewage, uh, electricity. I mean, all of those things, uh, you know, you have to aim at universal systems. You, you will never have. And the more universal the system is, the more uh, redistributive it is. Uh, so the, um, uh, now, uh, on the other hand, uh, it is quite clear that because of, for example, of the issue of informality in labor markets, uh, the, uh, the traditional instrument that, that uh, we have had in, in Colombia and in Latin America and probably in many other uh, developing countries uh, of, uh, you know, of a, uh, they, they say the contributory systems of social security, of course, mean that many, uh, 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 many uh, families and, and people are left out. Right. Uh, so, f so for those, in fact, you have to have a, a, a parallel system uh, of, uh, let's say, a specific policy, let's say, for the poorest uh, in, a, in, a, in a country, uh, which can be uh, in kind uh, uh, or can be, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the same money payments of different sort. Uh, in, in the case of Colombia, uh, we have developed uh, uh, many forms of money payment. One of the basic problems, uh, there are two problems, I guess, uh, uh, of that, uh, of those systems. The, the first one is that they are frag too fragmented. Uh, so it's quite unclear and sometimes you will never, uh, I mean, sometimes they duplicate and sometimes they leave, leave uh, some people out. Right. Of the system, so so one day, for example, this government we want to to have probably just one system, uh, you know, with characteristics of the household uh, that uh, can be, uh, you know, depending, let's say, on uh, small children, uh, uh, you know, uh, young uh, children, uh, or uh, older people, and, and see how the the system is. But it's one system with characteristics of the households. Um, anyway, uh, so the. Uh, so that has to be financed and, as well as um, uh, universal systems in the case of uh, yeah. uh, for education, health, uh, 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 poor housing, etc. They have to pay by budgets. That's right. <laughs> by yeah. the general budget. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so the, then the, uh, the essential issue is, uh, first of all, how much money uh, you raise. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and second, um, of course, how uh, the system of payments uh, including, by the way, uh, a, 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 the issue, issue which is very important in Colombia, which is how much do you nationally or regionally or locally mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the government that is responsible for the provision of uh, yeah. a specific service, uh, which is, of course, a complex topic uh, yes, in terms of the is. contribution that are given to uh, to the, the, um, and we don't have guard. time yeah. in this discussion, yeah. sadly, to get to it. Now, Santiago, you were nodding your head in, in agreement, I believe, when uh, the minister said um, that, of course, a lot of systems are in place, but they're very fragmented. So this is the issue, isn't it, to have a cohesive, simple system that is uh, able to address a lot of yeah. the situation. I look at the time, and I know we're running out a little bit, so I want to skip forward and get to the fiscal capacity. So how do we fund these systems? How do we fund these great? And of course, I'm looking to you, Finance Minister, again, because you are facing this problem right now. Yeah. You've had social unrest in the last year because of the controversial uh, tax reforms yeah. that are coming into play, and you are currently working on that situation yeah, now. Well, actually, I'm late because the, I was in Congress <laughs> uh, approving a tax, the tax reform in the first debate. 
And, and we were successful. The task, the, the first. But you, uh, you embody <laughs> the challenges there are in terms of getting this stuff, uh, uh, you know, put in place in yeah, terms of policy. Yeah, so yeah. give us top a sense of the challenges. No, there are top negotiations. I mean, yeah. in the case of uh, Colombia now, uh, we, we, in, in, this, in the fiscal area, we really have two problems. Uh, the, because the, the first one, in, in a sense, is somehow the inheritance of the COVID-19 crisis and, and other problems, for example, the uh, subsidies on gasoline prices, for example, in which the, uh, the fiscal deficit is still very high. So we have to correct the fiscal deficit. Um, and we have in Colombia a fiscal rule, a legal fiscal right. rule that we have to follow. So that's one challenge. Uh, it's a big challenge, actually. For example, the, this year, the, uh, the central government deficit, including the subsidies for fuel, uh, is 7.1% uh, of GDP. Mm. Uh, and our ta uh, according to the rules, uh, the, the fiscal rule, we have to get to uh, 4%. Yeah. So it's three percentage points of GDP. <laughs> Yeah. in terms of adjustment. So it's not an easy task. Uh, but on top of that, there are the social demands, uh, which were reflected uh, quite clearly in the, uh, in the protest, social protests last year. That's right. Uh, uh, and actually years before also, uh, uh, but also in the, um, in the elections. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the president who was elected was because of his social uh, uh, objectives, let's say. Yes. Uh, so, the, so the tax reform uh, that we are going through Congress uh, it's a tax reform that includes, a, a, first of all, a, a much more restrictive uh, personal income tax system, mm -hmm. uh, basically by limiting the, the uh, benefits that uh, uh, people of a certain level uh, 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 generate. That's one element. Eliminating some elements of the, um, uh, uh, of the um, uh, of, uh, sectoral uh, subsidies for, uh, in, uh, for, for, house, for, uh, for firms. Right. Uh, so, in, so that's also because there are many uh, a fragmented system of subsidies to different sectors that we're trying to simplify and get yes. very few subsidies in place uh, for uh, clear, basically for social and environmental objectives. I mean, to that's be clear right. Okay. Of what is, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and then we have a windfall ta a tax on, uh, uh, on uh, oil and coal, mm. uh, which uh, is actually very important in terms of revenues. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, that's an international trend now um, yeah. uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that Colombia is following. I mean, the, the Europeans just go through a, a European tax, let's say, for uh, on oil companies for into uh, to finance the product. And let me say, uh, perhaps finally, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I mean, there are many other elements, but uh, uh, the strong rules against tax evasion. Uh, yeah. Tax evasion is very high uh, in Colombia. Uh, and, uh, and, and the, uh, uh, you know, by s strengthening the tax administration through, actually, basically through uh, different, uh, uh, let's say, you know, access to different uh, yeah. uh, information systems, they say, yes. uh, which is possible today, uh, but also certain rules on uh, what can be deducted uh, because there's a, and, and, and how they can capture those were uh, yeah. evading. Those are real that's a, that's a very serious challenges, point. aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Yes, and I, who'd want to pick up on that? Because I know I can see Santiago nodding his head. And Neil Day as well, obviously within governments in Mozambique, you're dealing with similar issues, but again, from a, a different perspective, from an African perspective. So give us a sense of what's going on there. Yes, uh, we are dealing the same, uh, with the same problems. It's uh, difficult to put in place good social programs uh, without uh, fiscal space, so we have to, to find space uh, in somewhere. And uh, in the context of Africa, in, in which uh, it's the same in Mozambique, uh, the most challenge is to bring people that are in the informal sectors to the formal sector, so that they can pay taxes. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's a challenge because we have a large informal sectors uh, and we now in Mozambique we are working in the, some tax reforms specific on VAT but it's difficult because even the formal sectors um, they are facing too much challenge when we have to for example eliminate some exceptions uh, that we have on the VAT they are saying that they are not prepared to pay taxes. 
but in the same time, we need to bring new exemption for the sectors like agriculture, which is the one of the most largest sectors uh, in terms of employment mm. uh, in Africa, specifically in Mozambique. So it's difficult for the government, but we have to work in the, in the way that we can increase our revenue, yeah. uh, bringing more people uh, to formal sectors, to pay taxes, and now we are on this way because it's uh, the only way that we can uh, improve the social protection, the social programs. For example, when we had to deal with the cyclones, we have to ask to our partners to help us with the programs, with the cash transfers, right. and uh, in the same time with pandemic, so we have to, in the some way, to find a solution. Yes. And I think that the solution is coming from this side. Okay. Tax reforms, increasing revenues, bringing people that are in the informal sector to the formal sector, more people paying taxes. This is uh, the way. Yeah, no, and that's what we're trying to get at, is solutions here. I don't think we'll be able to do it in the hour and a half that we have. But, um, you know, Santiago, I'm really interested to hear your perspective, because this is something you've talked about, this tension between formal and informal, and just the issue of trying to, to, to you know, get some kind of tax uh, from these, these groups, and, and how this can benefit all of the social systems that we're trying to talk about here. So... Um, <laughs> it's so the curse of the microphone like with him. <laughs> yes. They like me now? Now they like you, yes. Okay. Um, so I was not here yesterday morning for, for Chico Ferreira's lecture, but I don't know whether he mentioned this or not, but in some of the research that he's done, uh, together with some other people, Nora Lustig, they show the following, which is really interesting. You take the average OECD country, and there, income inequality gives you a Gini, roughly, of about 0.48 before taxes and transfers. But then once you have taxes and transfers, you get a Gini of about 0.33 or something like that. Hmm. So what that says is that taxes and transfers, and taxes prominently, really matter in terms of lowering inequality. Now, if you do the same calculation, I haven't done it, but Chico and Nora and these people have done it. You get the Gini coefficient in Latin America is slightly higher before taxes and transfers, like 0.51 or so. And then you go through taxes and transfers, and you go down to 0.49. In other words, so it's barely making almost a dent. no change, yeah. 0.02, in the Gini coefficient as a result of taxes and transfers. What that really says is that your tax and transfer systems from the point of view of inequality, is extremely inefficient. Mm. There are many reasons behind them. Part of the reasons is the segmentation of insurance between formal and informal sectors, which generates by itself a lot of inequality. I don't have time to go into that one. But there's also a component, and that's connected to what Jose Antonio was doing here, having to do with the structure of taxation. Another interesting piece of data. In the average OECD country, the difference between countries in Europe, Canada, US, and Latin America in personal income taxes as a share of GDP is five points of GDP. Not 5%, hmm. five points of GDP. So, bottom line, in Europe, citizens pay taxes and they get back social protection. In Latin America, we sort of pay taxes and we sort of get back social protection. Yeah. So we're in a really bad equilibrium, in a really bad equilibrium, because, and this is something Marcela has researched a lot, that equilibrium also implies a, a low productivity distribution of firms. Mm. It's a terrible equilibrium, and the real trick is to convince society that we're all losing where we are. We're all losing, but there's no way of getting out of this equilibrium without paying more taxes. And that's where the challenge is. Of course, not only raising taxes, You've got to do all these, all these reforms, combat corruption and all that, but you've got to start somewhere, and in the region, the room for starting 
with a bigger tax take, particularly personal mm -hmm. income tax, as the current government is trying to do in Colombia, is, is probably the right place to start. Okay, good to know. That's excellent. Marcela. So let me pick up uh, where Santiago left. Um, so definitely raising our abilities to uh, raise taxes is, is fundamental and easy to talk from my position, not uh, from yours guys. Um, um, but then the other challenge uh, that arises there is how is it that we're able to raise more money and at the same time foster the productive capabilities that will bring down the point 51 to start with. Yeah. Um, and be able to create more income from jobs before having to redistribute and protect people uh, afterwards. Um, and I think that's, that's the other great tension. Um, the other interesting feature of economies such as the Latin Americans um, is that the little taxes they're able to raise they raise them from businesses rather than people, which is sort of the other way around in the richer uh, economies. And that has a good reason for it. We have very weak capabilities to raise uh, money to start with for the government. And it is easier to raise it from the businesses, which are easier to follow, uh, which are e where it is easier to uh, enforce things. Uh, but then the other challenge is not only raise money, but be able to raise it in a way that does foster those capabilities, and that means make it, making it easier for the business sector to grow and to generate those jobs, precisely for the people in the lower bottom uh, of the, let me call it, human talent and productivity um, distribution. And then not only how you raise that money, but also how you spend it is going to matter. Uh, so if we raise it and we spend it, for instance, in subsidies that are unconditional, such as the ones that we see pro or saw prominently during the pandemic all over the world, then you also have uh, great perils. Um, so the other question is, how do you spend that money in a way that is complementary to the generation of incomes by people and not supplementing, not substituting yeah. uh, that, race, that uh, generation of income by the households. Yeah, big questions indeed and very good questions. But I'm going to move on a bit because in, in the, uh, yeah, I'm taking a look at the clock there. Um, what I'm going to talk about next is really interesting because in the last two days, um, many of you uh, gave very fascinating uh, interesting presentations. I'm sure many of you have been paying attention to them. Um, these are really innovative ideas. They're very academic ideas, aren't they? Uh, on ideas on reducing poverty, on reducing inequality. But really, what is the main challenges in taking these academic ideas, which are great, um, and making them into policy? Because this is something that we don't see enough of. You know, we're not seeing governments take into account some innovative policy ideas that perhaps are slightly risky. You know, Progressa was risky when you first suggested it. So give us an idea of that challenge that policymakers have to face when they come up with coming up with these great ideas, taking into account the work that everyone here is doing. You know, what is the challenge in implementing these, these ideas? Is it fiscal, political, social, and how do we overcome them? Um, I'd love to hear from any of you with some perspective on that. And I know Santiago does have some perspective on that, but let's hear from uh, the minister. Well, the challenge is, first of all, political. Um, yes. So, the, you know, uh, but the, it's also because, of course, of the influence of uh, private interests uh, into the political life, let's say, <laughs> to be clear about that. So the, uh, and that's the, the big, big challenge. Um, uh, also, sometimes, uh, I mean, there are complex ideas that, um, uh, that are sometimes the agenda. I mean, here, um, for example, Santiago has been one of the uh, big champions of, uh, uh, of uh, not Actually, in Colombia in general, uh, also because he has also been a researcher in Colombia, by the way. Yes. <laughs> so, so the uh, 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 is uh, is if you finance some social spending with contributions uh, associated to employment. Uh, the formal workers in Colombia uh, you have to pay, uh, you know, uh, you know, contributions to pension, contributions to health, 
um, and, you know, others, other contributions, and to what extent that uh, generates in, informality, they say, or reduce formal workers. Uh, so that's one, uh, that's one big issue that, uh, that is always a, it's an academic topic and a big discussion about uh, how effective uh, that is, but also uh, uh, how difficult it is to finance it with public, uh, with the public, the central, let's say, the budgets, the central government budget. Uh, because if you don't have contribution, for example, let's say generally education uh, doesn't have contributions. I mean, I mean, very little from the families, so everything is more or less public. The public education uh, is fully financed by, by budgets. In health, you have a mixed system or in pensions, uh, but then you have the problem that uh, access uh, is limited because of the, uh, which is the topic, let's say, of discussion, and to what extent. But if you decide not to have a, a social security contribution, let's say, uh, then the central government uh, has to back, uh, you know, in Colombia, for example, not only the health system, uh, and it's uh, quite expensive, let's say. It's, it's a lot of uh, resources, let's say that. Uh, and you can say, for example, also uh, a, a pensions. The pension system, uh, you have the, the same problem, uh, in, uh, uh, but it is, it's tougher uh, because the, um, the, uh, in Colombia, the, you know, about one, only one-fourth of the workers get any pension. So the big pr issue is you know, how you complement that uh, with a you know, special program for the older people who don't have a pension. For example, we say income support. So it's, it's a very complex how you mix the, uh, the two issues. By the way, uh, perhaps, let me perhaps mention two issues that I, I think are important for the discussion. Sure. The, the first one, that I forgot when I talked before, that we also have a wealth tax. Mm. And, uh, yes. Uh, we, it has not been a continuous wealth tax, but we are proposing a continuous wealth tax, which is what Colombia had actually from 1936 to 1989. And, and so what people. happened in, after 89 to get rid of the wealth tax? <laughs> yeah, the, in most countries of the world, wealth taxes were uh, eliminated, including Colombia. But Colombia, well, the wealth tax is coming back uh, in many countries. And, and Colombia actually has been uh, used, uh, you know, this century, you know, in several years uh, yes. by different governments. But, you know, we're proposing a permanent uh, wealth tax. I say that's one point. But the other is uh, what we call the... Um, for the, let's say, for, this, for the small business, let's say, uh, where we have the, we call the, the, the program for the popular economy. Mm. Uh, so how you support uh, micro and small businesses, which are, let's say, the informal part of the economy. That's right. And how you, uh, you support them so they, they get, uh, you know, more productivity, more income, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a... Uh, in one, yeah. the, this call, but it, it has a long tradition in Colombia, in different forms, but it's not too strong, let's say, and, 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 and doesn't reach, uh, yeah. let's say, uh, many, many small businesses. Uh, so that's one yeah. program yeah. which includes, a, a, let's say, access to credit, uh, which, for example, we have to manage because the Ministry of Finance manages a system of development banks that we have in Colombia. Uh, uh, the second is uh, uh, technology, access to technology and training, uh, uh, you know, which today also is the use of digital technologies, uh, which you have to use yes. in all businesses yeah. today, uh, particularly when you have payment systems that increasingly use the digital systems, uh, and, the, uh, uh, and then commercialization, yeah. uh, how you support the, you know, the, uh, the small business selling their products, and in, in, my, in my way of thinking, uh, a, a, let's say, a, a supporting cooperatives of different systems of cooperation uh, is essential, particularly for that, yeah. for the commercialization. I'm going to jump in there because I just think, you know, everyone here in this room has some idea on how to reduce inequality. And I know we've heard some of those papers and projections over the last two days. So, um, and Santiago, I know you have a personal experience yourself of trying to get Progresa off the ground. So how difficult it is, and as you say correctly, Minister uh, Ocampo, it is political. It's a political challenge, isn't it? You need the political capital to back up some of these policies to really put them into play. So give us a sense of the struggle that you went through when you first introduced Progresa to your president at the time in Mexico in the 1990s, and just how you overcame some of those challenges. 
<laughs> the, the answer is fairly easy. Yeah. The president of Mexico was a very smart man. So I basically had to convince him. And he understood. The rest of the cabinet thought this was nuts. Most people that we discussed this said this was nuts. Uh, but the president understood and he was willing to take risks. Uh, these are not contexts that you face very often, particularly this is a political context in which the party in power at the time had sufficient power in Congress to actually carry the day. That's more difficult today. Mm. So I want to connect that to the earlier point that you made, which is we've generated a huge amount of knowledge over the last two decades, many of the people in this room have contributed to that. We know a lot about the impact of individual policies on individual outcomes. We do that very carefully with very, you know, a lot of technique, a lot of good econometrics. We have papers from all of Latin America and probably, you know, Kunal will know the literature from other regions of the world, from all over the world. So we know a lot about individual trees. What we need to do now is to think about forests. If you are a researcher, but you're talking to a policymaker, if you come to the policymaker and you say, look, I have this wonderful paper that shows that the impact of this, of X on Y, is W, and the policymaker says, yeah, that's great. However, you know, there's also X, Y, Z, Z, all these other policies at the same time. Tell me about, what about the rest of the story? Just, well, that I can't tell you. What I can tell you is that the impact of X on Y is Z, yeah. but yeah. how do I put the rest of the, you know, look, Trees don't grow on forests by, the, by magic. You know, it's important to understand the tree and therefore it's very important to understand the mechanism and the econometrics behind the identification of what you're doing, but it's also extremely important to place the individual tree in the forest and to look at the forest. And to come to your question, what the profession needs to do now if they want to influence more policymakers is to develop a language by which they have a view of the forest Yes. And they convey to the policymakers, look, this is the sort of the forest. We don't know the exact details of everything. It'll take us at least 25 more years of research to do that. But what, what we know right now, this is broadly what I think makes sense. That said, the second challenge would then be to communicate to the general public the sort of point mm -hmm. that Jose Antonio was making. But first, you've got to communicate from the academic community into the policymaking community to let them know that what you're doing and your research can actually be used in a real world context. Yes. And I think that's sort of where we're at. And, and Kunal, you know, should organize a conference a year from today uh, some, about looking at forests and not looking at individual trees and how do we think about the general equilibrium of all these systems in a more systemic way, even though the profession has been moving away from that uh, because of all the you know, identification which I sympathize, agree with, but it's not enough. Yeah. Stop. And I think everyone here can probably take some lessons from you, Santiago, in the kind of language needed to communicate uh, these ideas to policymakers, to convince them. You know, you were very lucky that you convinced your president, but, you know, obviously these are issues that, Anil Day, you're probably having to struggle with in, in Mozambique, and everyone does when you're a policymaker. So give us a sense of what you're having to deal with, because you are actually faced with rich gas deposit fines in Mozambique and the idea of then trying to get that revenue redistributed, uh, the struggle that you're having trying to find the right models to find uh, that revenue being distrib redistributed to the general population. That's incredibly hard, isn't it? Thank you. Uh, this is a good example of uh, a work to the government uh, <laughs> But this is a good example of how we have to discuss and to convince the politician that this is the right way because it's really difficult. For example, now we are working in the sovereign world fund law, trying to describe how we will be using this resource in the benefit of the population and the next generation. But when we start to discuss with the politician in high level, they have other opinion. So it's, it's really difficult. 
uh, it's just to, to, to say that it's, it's, it's a challenge. But um, uh, getting in the point of the huge amount of resource and the, the revenue that will coming from this LNG that we have in Mozambique, uh, what we expect it is to use this resource uh, to push the inclusive grow in order that uh, we can transform our working. It's probably the battery. Here, try, try this one. Yeah. We haven't tried that one yet. Hello. Does that work? Hello? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the idea is to uh, work in the social transformation. First, we have to deal with the investment of human capital with its a huge uh, uh, problem in, in, in our countries, in Africa, in Mozambique, it's the same. So we think that we can use this resource uh, to invest in human capital uh, for poor people, to increase the access of education, health, to design better social programs that will um, help us uh, with more employment. So we have a kind of a roadmap, a plan, but we don't know if it will work. Uh, we, we are now trying to get some experience of the countries that have this kind of resource, but in fact it's a challenge. But we, as a country, we all agree that we have to use this money to reduce the inequalities, to invest uh, in the country so to, that we have uh, uh, inclusive grow, a grow, a proper grow, yes. so we, we have a common sense in Absolutely. this. Great. Now, I'm going to try to open up the, the uh, session to the audience now. You've all been listening very interestedly, and I can see there's a real uh, sense of attention that you all have. So let's uh, have these microphones roam around and uh, get some questions. Yes, question in the front, and there's another one there. So let's hear from, uh, yes, yes, is it, it's Rachel, isn't it? You presented this morning, so it was, yes, very, very excited to hear from you. Yes. Oh, it's one of the ones that don't work. <laughs> oh, here it goes. Yes, we hear you. Okay, Raquel Fernandez, and so, I wanted to make one quick comment and ask a question. Quick comment is to your question is this world that in some sense looks worse because we have pandemics and we have uh, you know, climate change coming upon us. Is it going to make getting rid of inequality harder? And you could say yes, but a, a more optimistic view is that these are global problems that actually depend critically upon reducing worldwide inter-country inequality because you, know, you can't have countries cutting down trees or polluting uh, lakes or overfishing in oceans without that affecting all of us. So you might think that's going to be a reason you would see financial incentives transfers towards poorer countries. And for that same very same reason when it comes to health, you know, you, you're going to keep on having mutations as long as people cannot get you know, vaccinated, they don't have the roads for the vaccines, etc. So that part might make you optimistic or it might make you think we're going to hell in a handbasket. And then the question for the two of you, you know, Santiago, you said very convincingly, look, we saw intergenerational improvements because of conditional cash transfer programs and others on health and education. Good things happen, but then we didn't see that carry over to higher income for these individuals later on, and you say they need good jobs. And Marcela, you completely agree we need more jobs. That's going to be creating growth. That's a challenge for the economy. And what I still don't understand is why don't we have the good firms and the good jobs, given that we have more educated people, healthier people? What's the big uh, roadblock there? Yeah. Fantastic question and a fantastic point that you made as well. But let's take the next question. I think there was a gentleman there. Yes. Thank you. This is the, um, David Castells. Thanks for the discussion. And 
you guys highlighted, so one, one key variable here is productivity, right? So, um, so, I mean, the point here is how to increase productivity, and I mean, according to basic economic theory, so two ways is basically technological change and then a structural change, right? So my point here is why this is not happening in Latin American countries, productivity levels are still very low. And this may relate to, to moving up in the, in the value chain, right? So Latin American countries still specialize in commodities. So how to move up in sort of agricultural products to more sophisticated sort of, uh, I mean, in the, again, in the value chain or in the mineral sector, in the textile sector. Because, uh, again, so one thing is redistribution from top to the bottom, but as, as you guys highlighted, it's also creating income at the, at the bottom, and, that's, and the key here is to increase productivity. Okay, so how, how does this, this Latin America get to the next step? So let's get another question back there. Thank you very much. Um, Aya Bonga from South Africa. I, I found the discussion very fascinating. Um, Santiago, when the discussion started, you spoke about pre-market distribution or outcomes and, I guess, post-market distribution as a way to confront uh, and reduce inequality. Um, and I've got one question, and it's something I, I certainly have not heard even in the discussions over the last few days or so, which is around the redistribution of productive assets, uh, and in particular land reforms. I mean, if we look at the examples of India and China um, as countries that have you know, narrowed the gap um, from an equality perspective if we compare across countries. One of the distinctive features of both countries in the post-colonial moment has been the institution of land reforms. And I'm quite interested to hear from, you know, Finance Minister Jose Antonio, um, what your view would be on the role of the redistribution of productive assets like land in a policy package, especially in light of, I guess, the resumption of the peace talks uh, over the last few days or so. Okay, great. Let's stop there with the first three questions so we can remember them. So the first one was all about why haven't we got there yet in terms of the jobs and companies uh, to produce that incredible employment. Second one was how does Latin America go up the value chain in terms of digital, structural, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the last one, land reform. So let's, uh, let's take it. I think the first question was uh, Marcella. to Marcella and yourself. Go on. Great. So I, I would actually say the, the first two questions are basically the same question. Uh, why don't we have better productivity? And of course, that's uh, the, uh, the question of a very large literature that has created some more an questions than answers, and it does have uh, some, some of those answers. And here's my list of priorities thinking of, of Latin America. Though I see the puzzle that uh, Santiago is placing on us, I also see that it is very clearly the case that in terms of human capital, the quality of education that uh, people have on average and as a distribution in Latin America, we are starting from a distribution of human talent uh, that is still, that still displays a very large gap with respect to the distribution that uh, people are starting with in these very advanced economies. If we try to put a name and a face uh, to this informality problem, um, uh, then you can go out to the street and see the person who's selling, um, you know, a, a package of something on, uh, uh, in the street, um, or the person who sells you something in a beach, and, and that person is clearly endowed uh, with, uh, with a very poor uh, education to start with and capabilities for the productive sector. So I think that's a very, that's the first um, answer to that. By the way, that's part of what technological advancement may mean. Uh, you're starting from people who are better able to uh, use technology. So I think that's point one. Uh, then there is a second point. Now moving to what firms do, they st if you think of firms the way I like to think about them, these are organizations that bring people together to produce things. So one of the symptoms of underdevelopment that we have been talking about during this conference is the fact that the firms that we have in Latin America are bringing very few people. Um, that are very poor capabilities to start with. And then one the other question is, why don't they, they put together more people? Why don't they uh, uh, raise in terms of scale? So part of the answer is uh, placed where Santiago 
uh, started, uh, a labor market that makes it very difficult to really hire these people and put them together. So I would say even though there are very deep differences across the countries and the regions in the specific labor market institution, the overall result is that the labor market as a whole still is very against the uh, formation of these organizations that bring uh, people together. So I would say that's a second factor. That factor in itself also implies that growing as a firm will be difficult, will be costly, and therefore will, be not, will not be as profitable. So it also becomes a disincentive to invest in the other technologies that would be complementary to, to bringing people together. So I would say that's a, that's a third reason. And that, I think that, that set of reasons is very coincidental with the fact that we not only not have that many firms, we don't have that great firms, but the types of firms that we're mostly missing is the firms that transit from being these tiny things to uh, being small businesses rather than micro, uh, then being middle uh, size, middle sized uh, firms. So I would say that's a set of things that we need to address to start with. And of course, then there are the other more traditional problems that even advanced economies face uh, in terms of fostering uh, competition, um, etc. Now, the other issue is the structural composition um, of the economy. Uh, there is obviously a challenge that these economies have uh, faced. I'm sure uh, uh, Jose Antonio would be happy to uh, talk about that and disagree with me in many, uh, in many versions of, of what I say you know, about this. Um, but of course, one of the big problems that people have pointed out is we never really developed a manufacturing sector that was, that was strong. Um, I'd, I'd love to have, have here a picture that I, that I like to see uh, from, from my most uh, recent research. What's, what's striking is we, we didn't lack the manufacturing sector so much in terms of value added. We missed it in terms of job production. So the gap in terms of what the share of the overall employment that manufacturing generated in Latin America as a whole, compared to the US, the UK, uh, all other European economies, the Asian economies that are richer today, uh, is huge. Then if you go look at the, the gap in the share, not in employment, but the value added as a percentage of, of, of the total, that's not so much. In the peak of industrialization, value added in manufacturing as a percentage of GDP in the richer economies was around 27%. We were definitely below that even at the peak, but the number is like 24. When you look at employment, uh, you go from around 25 in those richer economies to 15, some of us 13. Uh, so again, yep. I would, I would go back to the labor market. I think we do have a huge uh, thing to talk about there. Um, and then I, I, I worry that in the discussion of going, of, of, the, of the missing manufacturing, we're gonna keep trying to jump into the third revolution when the, the world is in the fifth revolution. Uh, so I think that's a great danger in this discussion. Yes, and, and we are certainly running out of time to really tackle it all. Santiago, your remarks on that? No. Uh, <laughs> I think Raquel's question is extremely pertinent and, and, and a really relevant question. Yeah. So, uh, just to complement uh, most of what Marcela said, the issue is that we don't, ha it's not that we don't have enough firms. In fact, we have way too many firms. The issue is that we don't have enough productive firms. And, um, you know, roughly numbers. The US GDP is at least 10 times the GDP of Mexico. Mexico has half the number of firms that the U.S. has. So it's absurd. So we have a huge number of firms. So why is it that in Mexico, the more productive firms don't get out of the market the unproductive firms? We all learned from Schumpeter that there's this creative destruction process in which productive firms get big, they innovate, they do all these good things, and then the bad firms get out, and then the new firms come in and they create good jobs and productivity goes up. That process in Latin America does not work. And actually, I've done fairly careful firm dynamic data with panels, and what I show is that you don't have the productive firms growing, unproductive firms grow, they, they, they for a long time. Why? A lot has to do with what Marcela said, huge problems in the labor market, not only that, Huge problems also in the structure of taxation, all these special regimes for small firms that favor all these 
and huge problems in property rights. So that is where the deep issues are that explain why we can't create productive jobs, even though we are having more human capital and we're doing all these other things. Very, very quickly on the value chains. Um, I don't disagree, but I also want to put this in perspective. 30 years ago, Mexico had almost no manufacturing exports. Mexico today exports about $400 billion. It's about 35% of its GDP. We export more manufacturers than all of Latin America put together. And we export very sophisticated stuff. Aeronautical parts, automotive parts, electronics. 30 years ago, the informality rate in Mexico was 59%. Today is 57%. Exports went from 5% to 35%. So all this thing about value change and inclusive moving up to value, yes, yes, I'm for it. It is not going to solve the problems in the labor market because the problems in the labor market are in the areas that Marcela was talking about, I was talking about. This vast number of firms that create very low productivity jobs. Stop. Okay, thank you. And of course, that question for uh, the finance minister on the land uh, reforms. Well, le let me say that one peculiarity of Colombia mm -hmm. is that there are several agricultural ministers who become finance ministers. Very funny. I, I, I don't know many yeah. countries. I am one of those. Okay. <laughs> So you will have some so knowledge of land reform then? I was agricultural minister and actually the current agricultural land reform, the land reform law of Colombia was passed when I was agricultural minister. So in a sense, I'm the author of the... One of the Colombia has had three ways of agrarian reforms. One in the 1930s and early 40s, one in the 1960s, uh, and, and, uh, and then this began and was, and was not pursued too much, let's say, by later governments, uh, but is the, you know, still the law. But in the, uh, uh, in the peace agreement uh, with the major guerrilla of Colombia five years ago, the topic number one is integrated rural development, and one of the elements is land reform. Mm. Uh, I mean, in our view, the previous government did very little uh, in that regard, so one of the tasks of this government is actually to undertake uh, a significant land reform. Uh, and uh, that includes, uh, 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 that, that includes uh, let's say, uh, two issues. Actually, a redistribution of land, uh, actually uh, not, not through expropriation, actually through uh, but use of public lands, actually lands that have been uh, uh, expropriated from uh, illicit activities, let's say, uh, okay. drug trafficking, uh, paramilitary groups, uh, uh, which are held by one institution in the government, uh, and, uh, uh, and then purchasing land. Uh, and, well, and it's a, a public sector lands, actually, right. because uh, the, 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 there are many rural areas. So that's one element to, so to do a, a significant in, in redistribution of land. Uh, Colombia has actually, in several parts of the country, uh, a tradition of, of smallholders. Uh, so it's a mix of smallholder and, and, and large, uh, uh, large land holding uh, uh, you know, activities. Right. Um, right. So it's, it's a mix of those. So it's to support that, uh, which means that aside from the land reform itself, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we have to have the, uh, the uh, support to uh, smallholders, which is part of the, what is called, the thing we call the popular economy. Okay. So how, how you support yeah. uh, smallholder agriculture uh, in a significant way. Uh, you know, the three ways I mentioned, credit, technology, access to technology, or knowledge, let's say, and commercialization. Okay. So how you, you support them in the three areas uh, in a significant way. So the, we, we do have uh, the institutions uh, uh, that were actually put in place um, uh, uh, actually five years ago mm. uh, when the peace agreement was negotiated. I, I, was, I was asked by the government at the time to head uh, this uh, rural mission commission, <laughs> uh, which is the you know one of the frameworks for the current activities that we're yeah. so it's actually again a significant support uh, with the by the way this issue of uh, using associations as a major topic that has to be supported uh, in a significant way 
uh, in order to uh, support uh, the uh, smallholders. Okay. So it's both land and support to their economic activities. Excellent. Okay, yeah. there were more questions, so let's get them now. Uh, I saw some hands up this side just now. Yes, a uh, gentleman there. And another gentleman there, yes. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding uh, Santiago's comments on the role of academia in implementing all the knowledge that we as a field produce. And I, wa I wanted to ask you, um, uh, what do you see the role of uh, our field uh, going forward? Do you see it as a, a, is, is a field that uh, is called to have more people interacting with politicians and making uh, this knowledge uh, applied to the field? Do we see the field as something that uh, we make like literature reviews and in which we calculate the marginal value of public funds, compare them together and see what are the most uh, efficient policies that the government should, uh, should implement, but without getting involved in the politician discussions? Or do, we see, do you see this as, a, as something that should be done in every paper and have like a, kind of like a implementation revolution in which a responsibility of the researchers should be also to have some type of discussion about uh, the potential of implementation of all the policies that are being studied. Okay, interesting question. And then follow up, uh, yes. Um, but I think there was a gentleman just there first. And then we'll get a question uh, from, yes, the gentleman in the third row, yeah, fourth row rather. Y bueno, buenas tardes. Y pues mi pregunta, pues va a centrar en, digamos, Colombia particularmente pues es un país que también entre regiones pues tiene grandes desigualdades eh, fiscales también y también en, pues en las economías, porque particularmente pues Bogotá y Antioquia son las que eh, concentran digamos el mayor peso en el PIB. Entonces digamos, ¿cómo llegar, cómo, cómo mejorar la productividad en regiones como Chocó, Guajira, eh, el Cauca, el Amazonas? que son regiones que prácticamente se han dedicado a actividades primarias, extractivistas, que todavía siguen dominadas bajo economías ilícitas. Entonces, ¿cómo, se, cómo mejorar esa parte? Eh, tal vez eh, ayer Leiner, en una charla, eh, nos comentaba digamos, una propuesta que va encaminada a que pues, los departamentos o regiones con mejor desempeño fiscal pudieran transferir recursos pues, a esas regiones que obviamente no no cuentan con esas capacidades de ingreso. Yes, I'm sorry, I cannot help there because I do not have a translation, Mike, but I'm assuming you all know what that question was. And then a final question here from Emilia. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much and thank you to the panel. I am Amelia Santos from UNCTAD. And my question relates to uh, one of the, the issues that Marcella raised, but then uh, also later on uh, it, uh, it went to the international domain. Marcella mentioned that one issue in Latin America and the same in other countries is that businesses pay taxes. But these are domestic firms, they pay taxes. And then we have in the other side of the equation multinationals whereby governments in developing countries, especially Latin America, use fiscal incentives, especially corporate income tax, as part of the value pros proposition. So here we have two wars, one where the domestic firms pay taxes, and then foreign firms that needed foreign income, foreign investment, whether domestic or through big uh, public-private projects coming to the country based on corporate income tax holidays or incentives. So we have here a duality. How policymakers can deal with this and how research can help to, to address, to bring this to the forest of policy, the issue of um, investment and, and inequality. Thank you. Okay, so the first and the last question, they're somewhat related. Just how do we make some of these academic policies, the work, the hard work that everyone in this room is doing in terms of research, how do we make them into policy and, and be able to communicate that? Um, so, so thank you for the question. I mean, your question is very complex and sort of has a lot. I mean, looking forward, I think there's still a lot of room for research along the lines of what we've been doing for the last two decades, trying to understand how certain things work. I don't know if you were in Raquel's lecture this morning, for instance, right? Raquel's lecture was excellent. It, it sort of gives you a deep sense of why certain phenomena that we observe 
why do they occur? And sort of there's an economic interpretation of that and then you learn and it helps you to think. That kind of research is fundamental. So it's not either or, it's we need to widen and say, I've learned a lot from this. There are many other facts here. Next, let me do some research in which I try to put all these facts together and try to see how in the particular context of a country, they translate into policy making. I emphasize in the particular context of the country because that really matters. That really, really matters. And in my view, we need to pay more attention about the institutional context of individual countries when we try to think about policy making in countries. Um, so that's sort of broad research. The last one is, you mentioned about talking to politicians. I think it's essential. I mean, if you want to influence policy, you need to talk to the people who make policy. And you have to understand their constraints, you have to understand where they're coming from, and you have to understand how the issue that you're trying to put can be framed in such a way that from the point of view of the policymaker, it makes sense. And there, I think economists need to understand a little bit more the political economy of things and political dynamics and, and sort of get their hands dirty to be able to be and more useful and more constructive. Thank you. So let me take first this, this last question. Where I think you're, you're uh, raising a, a crucial issue. Um, and I think it's a good example also of the forest versus trees stuff that uh, Santiago was talking about. The justification for uh, holidays, uh, specific benefits for some very large investors, multinationals, uh, special economic zones, if you read through the literature, is generally, well, these countries not competitive in terms of its, uh, of its tax, uh, taxes for enterprises. Therefore, let's give benefits to some enterprises so we can grab some, uh, some of that investment. Um, it, so the solution, rather than going to the first diagnosis and looking at the overall system, is to try to focus on some specific investors and, and give uh, those benefits. And that's very uh, extremely prevalent, and, and we have to say that this country is heightened in that, uh, in that uh, domain. Um, the answer may be, maybe you, 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 there is a way to reconcile those two things. Maybe one way it's uh, let's remember we have an overall business sector that we need to foster, that we have this predominance of tiny firms that hopefully will become small firms someday. That's what we don't have. We have this plethora that Santiago was talking about. Way too many firms, but they, many of them don't, don't even respond to the conception of a firm. Um, so, so why, why don't we think that rather than uh, rate, uh, giving some benefits and holidays and stuff to some specific sectors, firms, etc., why don't we create a system that as a whole uh, is, is, uh, is much more friendly to these creations of jobs and things that we were talking about before. So for, if, if we were to talk about these countries specifically, um, I would say the ability to uh, do what you're saying would would uh, rest in um, having better tax treatment for everybody. That would be a lower corporate income tax rate, uh, less benefits for, for others, and then at the same time, once you have that, then you have the uh, you open the space for things such as the discussion of assuring a minimal effective payment of taxes by the very largest uh, corporations, which we all, uh, is very clear now, have the ability to play countries against each other all to, right. um, we, to, we, to we go We have that. run out of time, but I think the minister, the second question was aimed at you. The, so, the, the Spanish question. Yes, the Spanish question. <laughs> <laughs> the Spanish question was about how to, uh, you know, the regional uh, inequalities Right. Uh, you know, from you know, rich regions to poor regions, and how you can support the poor regions, and to what extent you should make transfers from the rich to the poor. Let's say, and uh, uh, let me uh, let, let me start actually is, uh, by stating one thing that is very important when you are in government, and, uh, uh, and in a sense, it's not always well researched, uh, which is how effective your system of implementation of action. Of delivery uh, is not, and, and which is creating. How do you create so, uh, public sector institutions uh, that actually do the job? Uh, and, 
And that's also uh, relevant for this issue because uh, how you strengthen local governments or you know, regional governments uh, uh, that are weak and, and therefore cannot deliver uh, is, uh, is one of the major challenges. It's not only financing, but actually how you develop those institutions uh, and actually those institutions also help to develop you know, private sector activities, uh, either small holding or large holding uh, activities, let's say, uh, in those regions. So it's a, it's a, it's a very important issue. Uh, le let me say that uh, 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 that is basically a state building or institution building effort that has to be done and how it has to be a long term. So it's a state, uh, it's an issue for, for a state, not for government. Let's say. All governments have to uh, you know, build up uh, and continue to, you know, to build on the system that uh, have been created and, you know, in education, in health, in, uh, uh, let's say, in, in every area, let's say. And, and I think the, that, is it, you know, that development of uh, institutions is very important. And now, of course, the, a very you know, major responsibility uh, is, to, uh, is how you help that, develop that at the local level in, uh, in backward regions. Yeah. Uh, so it's a, I think that's one element which is very important. So is the institution building support, uh, which can, can come from national governments, uh, but many, many times it's much better to use local or regional governments uh, to support, even uh, across, you know, like one region that is successful to, put, uh, to support in a region that is not, has not been successful. That's yeah. one more. In, the, in terms of financing, uh, the... Uh, uh, the, uh, let's say the system that is used in Colombia uh, is, uh, for redistribution is actually national taxes uh, that are, are uh, you know, given to local governments or to, to regional governments. And there is a, a, a very clear system by which uh, you have to guarantee that uh, the system is redistributed. Uh, so it's, it doesn't look as a, a transfer from region, regions to poor regions, but in fact it is. Yes. Uh, because the, you know, most tax revenues, for example, in Colombia are uh, from Bogota, mm. uh, but Bogota gets a very small uh, transfer from National Guard, and it has a local a capacity to do na a local taxes. Uh, so, but so the national governments uh, uh, really redistribute, so the, which are with taxes that are generated in Bogota yes. or Medellin or Cali or Barranquilla, let's say, are transferred to the uh, 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 localities that have. Uh, a much lower capacity. Actually, it's quite a, a good distributive system, yeah. um, you know, and, uh, but it's basically done through national taxes. Yeah. Uh, great. Well, we have run out of time. Uh, I know you've all got great questions out there. I do have one solution to what you just said, Minister, around building good public institutions. I think you need to hire more people from your old school <laughs> who obviously have done great research, they know what they're doing, and they have tried to look at issues, how to how we can make the world more equal, which is what this subject is all about. Now, forgive me, I'm going to ask a final question if there's nothing more, but I beseech all of you just to give me a 10-second answer if you can, because we have run out of time. I know we are testing the patience of our audience. So I'm going to return to my opening question about whether you're optimistic we can make the world more equal. Is this an achievable ambition in our lifetimes? So maybe just a yes and no answer if you can. Yes, let's start with you, Nilde. <laughs> yes, it's a, a kind of difficult question. Um, I don't know. I think <laughs> we're, we're talking in our lifetime, so we say we, let's say let's let's say fifty years in the next fifty yes, years. Yes, maybe in the next uh, twenty-five years. Okay, maybe. So you're much more optimistic <laughs> than, than I am. Uh, but it's all come for. Well. There are two dimensions, because of the international dimension and the uh, national dimensions, let's say. Uh, uh, let's say in the international dimensions, there are institutions, but they're very weak, and the funding that they uh, transfer uh, are very small. I mean, when you think, uh, you know, how much is official development assistance, uh, you know, the 0.7% tar target that was defining, defining the UN half a century ago uh, is only followed by, you know, four or five countries. So that's one. And, and for example, now for uh, climate change, uh, there was a target that it has been also not met. Uh, yes. so, the, so that's one issue. Now you have the, the, the a system that has been uh, improving, I think, in terms of uh, size, 
which is the system of multilateral development banks, and, uh, you know, yes. in which you have a, they have been growing the regional development banks faster than the World Bank, but the World Bank also, uh, you know, also growing. And, and this, that system actually can be very supportive right. uh, uh, for development, uh, and, and, and it is uh, in, in many cases, uh, particularly during crisis, for example, during the COVID-19 so, crisis, yes. it was very critical. At the local level, you know, it's a question of po national policies. Okay. And I, I think I am optimistic, of course, I'm part of a government Great. that wants to do it. So, yes, <laughs> so, I'm hearing yes so, from you. <laughs> so I, I, hope, I hope we can, uh, we yes. can uh, uh, make progress in that regard. Excellent, Marcella. Thank you. Possible, definitely, if we play it right. But there are very many challenges to playing it right. Uh, one, convincing uh, the world that uh, there needs to be the kind of redistribution across countries that uh, uh, Raquel was mentioning, rather than the race to the bottom that you were also mentioning. Um, but also, if we're able to convince, uh, or if people get convinced uh, that this really is a priority and that more pockets would need to be touched than people think. Uh, if we're really able to prioritize the poorest and being able to uh, move everybody to a, a more middle bag, um, I think that's a possibility. But the challenges are definitely great. The social movements in Latin America are only approved to that. Okay, so your answer is possible. <laughs> possible. Santiago. If you're not optimistic, you've got to commit suicide. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not planning to commit suicide. <laughs> Excellent. Well, a big round of applause to our amazing panelists. And thank you all for such great questions. That was fantastic.